This is the Getsy Health Podcast with Janique and Tristan Roney. Hey, you guys. Welcome back to the Getsy Health Podcast. Hi, everybody. Um, we've had a fun week, <laughs> haven't we? I don't why, How? What? <laughs> what happened this week? <laughs> I can't remember. Um, we launched our membership. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Only that thing that wasn't, I've been... Wasn't that two weeks ago? Well, we launched it, it. I mean, this is like the first week of like people being active and we oh. interviewed, which was unfreaking believable. So mm-hmm. you guys in the membership, we interview people, we interview experts as well. We interview other members because a lot of these members joining have been on health journeys for ages. Long time. Well, and what was really amazing with was we were supposed to just talk about how she reversed her migraines. We spoke about how she got rid of like her too many to count cysts on her thyroid wow. and how she took in for like, cause her two, and maybe I shouldn't announce this, but anyways, she is now fertile. She, <laughs> so where's before, <laughs> how do I even say that subtly? I think, yeah, I think it's too late. It's too, I think it's way too late. If you're subtly. listening, I am really sorry. I hope your family's not listening. Um, <laughs> but I mean, her first two pregnancies were IVF mm-hmm. and like really rough. And then mm-hmm. she literally announced while we were doing the live that she is currently pregnant without any hormone therapies whatsoever. So migraines, infertility, Hashimoto's, like she healed that. All that from a week of the membership? No. Wow. <laughs> no, no, Holy guys. cow, you guys. No, 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 no. But what she was saying was she had been spending about a decade. And here's the thing. Here's the key. It takes time. It does. Right? And that's what we talk to members about all the time is healing takes time. She reversed all of those things and it took 10 years, you know, Mm. like the migraines went first Mm -hmm. and then it was the Hashimoto's and then it was the infertility, you know? So when people come to us and they're like, well, what is it going to take? And it's like, well, how much time do you have? Mm. You know, because sometimes like thyroid disorders can take, you know, two years. Right. Minimum. So I don't know. Are you allowed to spoil that for all of our listeners here? What, like what were some of the secrets that she did? Is it oh. basically the stuff that we already talk about? We talk about it a lot. Yeah. It's oh. nutrition. Oh. Really. Oh. It's her finding her food triggers. Mm-hmm. Even And she was, one thing that she did was um, she took, took her blood sugar like four times a day. And she saw from like her blood glucose spiking mm. what was causing inflammation. Oh, yeah. That's that's awesome. And that takes so much discipline, so by the way. So much. Well, healing takes a lot of discipline, right? It does. That's true. It can. And so, but when you're motivated, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, like she she was non functional. Like right. migraines will put you out. Right. And so she I mean, she was finding that even eating like sweet potatoes, her blood sugar would go through the roof. So yeah. she would have to cut that out and then she'd eat another food and her blood sugar would go through the roof and she'd have to cut it out. This is really important, everybody, because this is one of the concepts we always talk about is personalized medicine or personalized nutrition, yeah. right? You cannot just go on to Google, search up a topic and yeah. then follow whatever advice you find on the first blog that shows up because all of those blogs, while they might be well-researched, they might have all kinds of beautiful information. They are written to a general audience, Mm -hmm. not to you personally. Right. And so in order for you to learn what your body likes and needs and wants, you have to start listening to your own body. Exactly. Which means you have to be willing to do things like did. Yeah. Where you are tracking your blood sugar or journaling your foods and your symptoms. And that's what she did every too. day. She Absolutely. Journaled I don't food, doubt that for symptoms, a second. Like everything. She tracked everything really closely. That's incredible. It was and, really cool. And the results paid off for her. So she's got a lot to show for that effort. Right. Exactly. So anyways, that was fun. We've launched where like, it's been really fun. You guys, if you want to join the membership, go to mygutsyhealth.com. It's really, really awesome. There's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Mm. If you join, don't get overwhelmed because you'll feel like you're being hit with like a massive wave of information. Mm -hmm. You just take it slow, Mm -hmm. download it, put it in a binder and come back to it when you're ready and join in the discussion online, on Instagram, in the lives, all the things. Okay. Yeah, definitely. But what are we talking about today? We are talking about Dun, dun, dun. Anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients. Oh my gosh. This is like one of the, I wouldn't say one of the worst topics, but it's it's very controversial. All right. So here's why we're talking about this. Because uh, a couple weeks back, we brought Cecilia onto the show and we talked about A and anti-nutrient, which was phytic phytic acid, acid. right? Phytates. And um, that was a great episode. We learned a lot. But 
uh, it made me realize that like, we've never talked about anti-nutrients in general. No. And we haven't talked about the right way to think about anti-nutrients. Right. So that you don't make some bad decisions. Right. In fact, this is what we were just talking about in regards to you cannot go online, look something up and then expect that whatever first search result pops up Mm -hmm. is something that you should personally apply to your life. Right. Exactly. So let's, let's get into it. What, what is an anti-nutrient? Tell us, Justin. Okay. I guess I will tell us. An anti-nutrient, I don't know. I think the technical definition is that it blocks absorption of other nutrients. Right. Right. Maybe a more applicable definition though would be it's It's something found in foods, usually plants that causes problems Mm -hmm. in the body sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes, not all the time. That's the key. Right. Sometimes is the key. Well, and what are some factors that can um, inhibit or not make it an issue when you're eating anti-nutrients? Well, probably how well your body is doing overall, yes. for starters. I What I see is if you grew up eating mostly plant-based, like whole foods, you have less of a intolerance to anti-nutrients mm. and you do really well with them. Mm-hmm. The more uh, of the standard American diet you ate, your body lost the ability to handle anti-nutrients. And so it can Along be, with nutrient nutrients. It, exactly. With, <laughs> along with just digestion in general, mm-hmm. you know, because your body is so used to, and I say this a lot, what you feed breeds, and I'm mm-hmm. referring to gut biome. So when you are feeding your gut biome simple carbs, mm-hmm. that's what you're breeding. Mm-hmm. And so you have this massive flora that just digests really starchy foods. So when you start bringing in complex carbs, like mm-hmm. vegetables, your gut flora is like, what are you doing to me? Right. Right. And so people that go from the standard American diet to whole foods, it can sometimes be a really rough transition, Yeah, which is why I always say like when you're starting, cook 90% of your veggies, cook, saute, yeah. bake them, you know, whatever it takes to break down that fiber to help release the anti-nutrients. So does cooking destroy all the anti-nutrients and all the food? It will lessen it. Lessen it Probably immensely. depends on which foods. Right? Exactly. Soaking helps too, as we spoke about in the phytic acid Mm -hmm. episode. So Mm -hmm. soak it, Mm -hmm. you know, but anyways, Mm -hmm. it's, but so our, this is the thing is people want to talk about anti-nutrients and they're like, oh, they're so bad. And it's like, well, it depends on the person. Right. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. And in fact, I want to talk more about that toward the end, but first I want to help people know what exactly these things are so Mm. that they even know what we're talking about here. Yeah. Because there's a decent chance that you listening right now have never even heard of the word anti-nutrient, but you've probably heard of some of the anti-nutrients that we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's get into those. Let's do it. Um, and, and maybe let's just start with the one we've already covered so we can briefly recover it, which is the phytic acid. Yeah. Right. Phytic acid is, uh, it, it tends to bind to minerals, yeah. uh, particularly calcium, magnesium, iron, copper, zinc, you know, just the most important ones in our bodies. Yeah. So, in susceptible people, eating foods with phytic acid can cause some major mineral deficiencies, which will then wreak havoc in all sorts of different ways throughout your body. Well, what we also spoke about with Cecilia is because it can bind to iron, like you said, mm-hmm. but if you are mostly plant-based, that's mm-hmm. more of an issue because mm-hmm. of the, is it non-heme or heme iron? In plants, it's non-heme. And then, so it's more of an issue with non-heme, mm-hmm. but if you're eating, you know, some animal protein with iron, mm-hmm. which is heme iron, then it's not as big of an issue. Right. So uh, another principle, I'm going to, I'm going to do a little spoiler here. One of the main principles that we're going to try to drive home here today is that eating a variety of healthy whole foods Mm -hmm. can save you from a whole long list of potential problems. Definitely. A lot of issues show up for people because they pick, you know, a dozen foods, if that, and they just do those foods over and over and over and over and over and over again. Mm Mm-hmm. And that can lead to some imbalances like we might see here with the phytic acid. Now, you tend to get phytic acid from nuts, seeds, and grains primarily. Um, And so if you are doing a lot of grains in particular, but also, you know, nuts and seeds, then over time, if you're not getting some of the balancers, for instance, uh, whole food vitamin C can help with iron absorption, specifically non-heme iron absorption, Mm -hmm. which means that potentially it could help to balance out the phytic acids in your food. But if you're not getting a lot of whole food vitamin C, 
then you have that imbalance show up. Right. Right. So that's phytic acid. Is there anything else we need to say about it? No, Cause I, I feel like if you want that, go listen to the episode. Yeah. Right. Um, but the, the next one I want to talk about are lectins. Cause that's another mm. one that a lot of people have probably heard about. In fact, that may be the most famous anti-nutrient right, right now. Yep. Maybe. Right. And lectins are found a lot in beans. Uh -huh. and what, what do they do? What's, what's the problem with lectins? So lectins are there. It's basically mother nature's preservative. And so it helps to preserve the beans and the seeds and the nuts. And um, basically it's, it's just harder to digest. I, I mean, who has anyone tried to eat a, a raw bean? You know, like it, it's, it's almost impossible. Well, so I feel like we talked about this at one point, but there was a, a radio show, I think in Japan back in the day, it's been like 20 years. I don't remember exactly. Pardon me for butchering the details on this, but they were doing this. It was like a weight loss challenge where you ate white bean powder. Oh God. Do you remember us talking about this? No. I um, don't. And, and so like they were telling all these people, Oh yeah. If you uh, create white bean powder by basically blending up these white beans, Navy beans, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and the powder will, will help you lose weight. Um, as it turns out, they, I think someone ended up dying from this. Oh my God. Because they were getting such a concentrated source of lectins. Wow from this white bean powder. Wow. Right? So that's, I mean, that's a, a horror story and obviously no one wants that to happen. And, and that's a far cry from what is the real risk when it comes to these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But, um, the, the fact is, you know, lectins are a type of protein. They're found in almost all foods, but in different concentrations. Yeah. Right. So they, they do tend to be a little bit more concentrated in things like, uh, legumes, mm -hmm. uh, beans and grains. grains. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, the kind of the gist of the anti-nutrient aspect of them, and they may not even be a true anti-nutrient. I don't know. I don't know if there's like a, an official categorization, but, um, they increase gut permeability. Yeah. Is that a yeah. pretty good characterization of the problem? Yeah. And what, 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 like to, to make that more simplified is it's like sandpaper on your gut oh, basically. Yeah. So that gut permeability good. just might feel like a buzzword to some people. So, well, yeah. So let's describe what that means. That mm -hmm. means that it's essentially causing the gaps between the cells in your intestines to get larger. Right. Well, which, yeah. Right. Yep. And that means that things that are supposed to stay in your intestines no, can get out of your intestines. Into your bloodstream. And what happens when foreign proteins get into your bloodstream? It triggers your immune system. Your immune system loses its mind. Yeah. And it says, we're never letting that happen again. Well, and or it even says like, you're not supposed to be here. Definitely. Like, why are you here in the bloodstream? Mm -hmm. Like, we're going to do something about this. Mm -hmm. And then they attack that and protein similar to that. Right. So they start producing um, antibodies against those proteins. Yeah. And then suddenly you have yourself a food sensitivity. Yep. Because every time you eat, your body says, I recognize that protein. Uh-uh. Yep. And then you get an immune flare up. Yep. But it can also drive autoimmune disease. Yeah. So... Um, what's the takeaway from this? So, but, but lectins, they don't have to be such a bad vil villain because right. you can soak them, rinse them really well, and mm -hmm. then cook them really well. And so I, who is that doctor that wrote the Dr. Gundry? Paradox? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He says to cook your high lectin foods in a, in a pressure cooker. So, so he doesn't pot. say to avoid lectins no, altogether. No, I think he says to soak them mm -hmm. and then, you know, be mindful if you have a high mm -hmm. intolerance, but soak them really well and then cook them in an instant pot. Oh, that's right. And he also sells an anti-lectin supplement. Oh, he does? Mm -hmm. oh. I wish I could remember what it was called, but uh, yeah, so you, you're supposed to take it, and it at meals when you're having lectins and it the blocks lectins. The, the lectins. Cool. So that they can't destroy your gut. So apparently. fancy. Yeah. These products I mean, people come out with. Well, it, it, it's an interesting business model, right? Yeah. You uh, first you Demonize popularize <laughs> a, a bad guy and then you sell the hero that's going to kill the bad guy. Right. But that, you know, that's not to say that Dr. Gendry was wrong. I think no. that millions of people or at least many thousands of people have found huge relief from gut issues and autoimmune issues by following his advice. Mm -hmm. exactly. So, so it's great. But once again, the takeaway is not that you have to cut out all legumes. No. 
or necessarily all grains. They are super high in so many vitamins and minerals, B vitamins. I mean, they're they're wonderful. And lectins actually have like anti-cancerous properties too. What? Didn't you, didn't you tell me that? I don't know. I might have, but I don't remember. That. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, I mean, they have some good benefit mm-hmm. if you can digest them. So absolutely. So what do you need to do? Get your inflammation down mm-hmm. and get your gut biome really hearty mm-hmm. and, you know, be able to digest them, hopefully, or soak and cook them in the Instapot. And if right. that is still too much, then leave them out of your diet for a little bit until you heal up. Yeah. And and that's really, I think that's the most important thing is that if you're having major digestive issues, then this is a potential pathway to look down. Yeah. Right. It's one of the many options that you can consider in healing. So if your diet happens to be very high in lectin containing foods, the legumes and the grains primarily, and you have these big digestive issues, See what happens if you go off of them for a few weeks. Yep. You'll be fine. I promise there's lots of other good foods out there you can do in the meantime. Mm-hmm. But if you notice a massive improvement in your digestive health during that time, maybe it's the lectins. Yeah. Right? There you go. Um, okay. Next one. Um, j- quickly with lectins. Oh, yeah, there yeah. are some veggies that have lectins too. So be mindful, oh, yeah. like nightshades, for instance. So that, that's going to include like tomatoes and mm-hmm. eggplant and peppers, peppers. pumpkin are potatoes a nightshade too um it's i think they are yeah no no i don't think they are what mm-hmm. corn right. is cucumbers are though corn and cucumbers mm-hmm. so yeah. that's why i tell people that have an issue with yeah. like uh when they put their cucumbers mm-hmm. in the green smoothies i say peel them mm-hmm. and i have a lot of people that peel their cucumbers and they're mm-hmm. like i'm fixed yeah I'm like, oh, it was the so peel. are the, the lectins are in the peel then i is think the majority the of them are in the peel and so i just tell oh. people to peel it and they don't seem to have a problem all right but if you still have a problem then just omit the cucumber completely and give your gut a break okay so uh can i talk about the next one now yeah can we move? okay so the next one i want to talk about is this is a fun one it's the the glucosinolates also known as the goitrogens goitrogens that's a big big one that people keep bringing up because right. a goitrogen is basically a, a molecule a substance that blocks Um, iodine absorption. Now, iodine is really, really important for thyroid function. And the majority of Americans are low in iodine, Mm -hmm. especially if they live inland and they're not by the ocean and the sea eating Mm -hmm. a lot of seaweed Mm -hmm. and sea fish. I guess all fish is sea fish. Um, Actually, not all fish. No, that's not true. There's freshwater fish. There's freshwater fish. fish. Not going to have much iodine in it. Right, exactly. So, um, so, So the issue with people saying what about gorgogens is it demonizes one of my most favorite food groups on the face of the planet. And that's cruciferous vegetables. Mm -hmm. See, I am of the mind that everyone should consume like at least one serving of cruciferous Mm -hmm. every day. Yep. If your body can handle it. Um, now what is a cruciferous vegetable? It's broccoli, cauliflower, mm -hmm. cabbage, Mm -hmm. Brussels sprouts, Mm -hmm. kale, um, kale, but bok choy, bok choy, asparagus, and, I think, right? No, asparagus. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. Then what is it? I've why always wondered what category. Why don't I look it up while you keep talking about uh, questions? All right. Did you, did you cover all of them? I, I think that's a lot mm-hmm. of the cruciferous. Now the cruciferous vegetables are incredible for so many reasons. For one, they have a lot of roughage, which means that they can help your digestion quite a bit, right? Keep things moving. Um, prevent uh, buildup of nasty stuff in your intestines and colon. Um, they also have a lot of really great micronutrients. Tons. Like I'm going to butcher this diendomethylate. I have no I, idea. I missed some words in there. DIM. D-I-M. And oh yeah, that's really great for sex hormones, estrogen. Right. So if you are estrogen dominant, um, which puts you at risk for certain types of cancer and other issues, uh, then DIM, D-I-M, uh, can help to clear that estrogen, which mm-hmm. for a lot of women in particular is just a huge lifesaver. Yep. Especially if you've been living off the standard American diet. Uh-huh. And, and again, one of the, the best sources of that is this list of cruciferous vegetables that we've just given you. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also contain something called sulforaphane. Yeah, which is fantastic. Now, you've done a whole bunch of hair analyses, and how often does sulforaphane come up as like an antioxidant like, that people are really needing more of? So much. Quite a bit. Mm-hmm. 
So it, it, sulforaphane is an antioxidant, uh, among other things. Yep. It helps protect your, your cells and specifically your mitochondria mm-hmm. so that they can continue functioning well. Exactly. Christopher's vegetables, guys, are just wonderful. They are all like, they're so good for your gut biome, um, I, everything. Just, I can't not love them enough. But they are but goitrogens. Mm-hmm. They, they do block iodine uptake in high enough doses. Well, which Oh, keep going. Sorry. Which is the reason why we often, it seems like every week someone is coming to us saying, why do you have so many cruciferous vegetables in your recipes? Because we love them. <laughs> they're goitrogens and, <laughs> and I have Hashimoto's, so mm-hmm. I can't touch that. Right. And, and our response is usually, are you sure you can't touch that? Right. Are you, are you saying that because of personal experience or because you read about goitrogens somewhere on the internet right? or you saw it on Instagram and now you've just cut out that whole food group right? trying to avoid the problem. Which is very tragic. Now, here's a great way to avoid the problem. You cook, you bake, you steam, you saute your cruciferous vegetables. And that does it. And it does most of it, yeah. Well. And it's, I mean, so think about this. How many people have eaten raw broccoli and they've either burped up broccoli all day long or they were extremely gassy at the end of the day? Okay, so when I'm working at the clinic on days when I'm in the clinic. Um, you get that tray, that veggie tray. I, it's, it's a bag, um, okay. but it's, it's broccoli <laughs> and cauliflower <Excuse> <laughs> and carrots. Right. And sometimes I'll get some guacamole and that's, that's basically my, my meal for the day. Mm-hmm. And it's fantastic. I love it, but it tears you up. I can tell you by the end of the day, if, if I haven't remembered all of my digestive stuff that day, I'm going to be a little bit gassy. Yeah, I am. Exactly. Because those those raw cruciferous, they can be challenging for a lot of people. Very few people that I know of and clients I know of can digest cruciferous vegetables raw. Mm-hmm. Very few. Mm-hmm. And as and the further we get in, I guess, years, um, the, the less people are able to digest, are period. You, are you saying the older we get? Well, I mean, like... The further we get down the standard American diet oh, timeline right. is what so, I mean. So as we have fourth generation yes. standard American diet eaters, yep. yeah, they become even less likely to be able to handle I the mean, raw stuff. Think about it this way. I mean, and maybe this is just my little narrow view of the world, but 15 years ago, how many raw foodists were there? Thriving. A lot. Thriving. They well, were doing great. Yeah. And now like... So many people are like, I tried raw food and it killed me. It yeah. almost killed me. I almost died. I felt like I was dying. And, mm-hmm. and, and I feel like people are not able to consume raw food. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I think it's, it's becoming less and less and less. And, right. and it, again, it's, it's the training of the gut biome. It's mm-hmm. the training of the digestive tract. Mm-hmm. You know, we have trained our gut biome and our GI tract to metabolize the standard American diet. Therefore, that's all we're doing. And when you throw in complex carbs like... You know, goitrogens, goitrogens and mm-hmm. cruciferous vegetables. The gut is like, what the heck did you just give me? A mm-hmm. brick. Right. You know, so you have to, you have to practice it. It's like, you know, not training to run a marathon. Mm-hmm. And then you run a marathon the next day and you feel like you're dying. Right. You know, the gut biome is the same. Yeah. So another thing to keep in mind with the, the goitrogens is that the body is really, really efficient at recycling iodine. Mm-hmm. So even if your iodine intake is being blocked by cruciferous, assuming that that's, you know, a thing that's going on for you. Um, you may still be fine if you have enough iodine already circulating in yeah. your system. Yeah. Right. So you do not need to cut out this whole category, which by the way, also includes radishes mm, and, and must not that a lot of people out there are eating mustard greens, but I think they're pretty great. Mustard greens? Yeah. They're disgusting. What? But they're so like good for you. I'm not. They're, they're very bitter. Don't put them in your smoothies. <laughs> they're really bitter. Um, but anyways, like that's 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 our thing with goitrogen. Goitrogens. It's a really hard word. Um, just take more iodine if you are concerned about that. Cook your cruciferous vegetables, guys. Mm-hmm. Saute them, steam them, bake them, whatever you need to do to help break that down so you can digest it better and not have that be an issue. Yeah. And you can always get kelp or seaweed and just increase your access to iodine in those ways as well. Totally. Um, Now, if you really want to be sure that 
your thyroid health is on track, you might want to just do some blood testing. Yeah. Um, rather than, you know, cutting out food groups and trying to guess about what your thyroid's needing or what your iodine status is like. Exactly. If you have really, you know, low T3, then mm-hmm. maybe you do need to back off the cruciferous and get more iodine in your foods. I don't know. Yeah. But going back to the whole, like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe it blocks some iodine, but mm-hmm. look at the 20 other amazing things that it does for your body. Yep. If we did that for every single food, because with every food, there's a reaction in the body. There's right. an action. There's a reaction. Mm-hmm. There's t- like with healthy foods, there's 10 positive actions and one negative reaction. Right. Right. And so if we are, if we were to do that with every single healthy food, you would be living off of a diet of water and air. And then you would die. Well, yeah. And we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, But there are people who do believe that's the solution, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, not really the water and air piece, but but virtually cutting out all foods. Right. Um, Let's talk about oxalates. Oxalates. We haven't covered that one yet, right? No. So 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 oxalates are, (laughs) they're found in a, a very random group of foods. It's one that it can be really difficult to like, oh, this is the type of food I need to avoid because it can be in tea. Yeah. (laughs) If you're a tea drinker, I don't know. Yeah. Any British listeners? (laughs) Um, Spinach is probably the most common source of oxalates that people tend to get, but also parsley. Yeah. um, (laughs) Rhubarb. I don't know. (laughs) I don't eat much rhubarb. But the problem with oxalates is that they bind to calcium. Which can then cause kidney stones. Because it prevents absorption, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't absorb calcium, then it basically, it sits in our bloodstream. Yeah. It ends up getting filtered by the kidneys. And over time, it can cause a buildup, which is, you know, kidney stones. Right. And those hurt, I hear. Yeah. Like a ton. There's a genetic component, isn't there, with oxalates too? Well, I think with all of these things, there's probably some genetic uh, weaknesses that make people more prone to suffering from these types of things. But um, there are a lot of uh, kind of inherited kidney stone uh, conditions and people who just by, you know, luck of the draw, they tend to be very, very prone to getting kidney stones. In fact, I, I once worked with a person, this was back in a former life of mine, but this person was coming to therapy because of how many kidney stones he would get. Mm -hmm. In other words, his pain level was so frequent and so high that it was causing him to be intensely depressed and suicidal. That's hard. Right. And so this is, this is something that, yes, if you are in this category of people, then oxalates might be your absolute worst nightmare. And if you've ever had a kidney stone, then you're probably willing to do anything it takes right. to avoid getting the next one. I hear it's worse than labor. Yeah. I've yeah. never had one. I've heard that too. But um, but if you are doing like green smoothies, for instance, and you're pumping it with spinach and you're having like weird health issues, that could be one because a lot of like high oxalate foods, I think it's like 120, I don't know what the, the measure unit is, mm. but then spinach is like 600. You know, so it's pretty significantly high. So if you are having issues like metabolizing your smoothies or getting really tired after them or having strange reactions to your green smoothies, cut out the spinach for a little bit and see how you do, Mm -hmm. because that might be the the thing. Yeah. I mean, but it's not just spinach, right? If you do have an oxalates thing, then you've got to watch out for almonds Mm -hmm. and cashews and beets and... Baked potato skins. Yeah. Um, uh, what else? Cocoa powder is on that list. Yes. I mean, you're going to have a hard time. Raspberries have it for some reason, mm-hmm. right? So you're going to have to be really careful. I don't think that there's even full agreement on what the high oxalate foods is even. Yeah. And this is an issue with a lot of the anti-nutrients that there's uh there's not a kind of a set list of, oh, here's all the foods and there are, there are how much of this anti-nutrient they contain. Yeah. So you have to play around with it, right? You have to test things, try removing different groups of food out and see if you notice an improvement. Mm -hmm. If you do, then great. Stay off of those things until your body heals up some more. Exactly. But don't stay off of these things forever Yeah. because we already know that spinach has all kinds of incredible benefits to it. Right. 
And beets could be the thing that saves your gallbladder. Right. So you don't want to cut that out forever. Or beet greens. And cocoa powder. I mean, come on, guys. Chocolate. You don't want to. Come on. <laughs> right. Don't. <laughs> this, is, this is us telling you on our health podcast to not give up chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure it's dark. That's yeah. all. <laughs> minimal chocolate. I mean, minimal, minimal sugar. sugar. That's right. Exactly. Uh, anything else we need to say about oxalates? Oh, here's another thing. Just because you get kidney stones doesn't mean that you have an oxalates issue. Okay. Well, you might. There's other types of, of kidney stones out there. Yeah. They're not always just calcium based. So, um, you might need to look deeper on that. Maybe someday we'll do a podcast episode on kidney stones. I think that'd be really great. Cause there's, I think there's a lot we could say on that, right? Yeah. Tons. Um, all right. Uh, I don't know. How many more of these do we want to do? There's, I, I think this covers like the big ones, but there's yeah. a whole bunch of small ones. So maybe we can spend like just a couple minutes on each of the small ones. Go ahead, babe. Okay. So uh, protease inhibitors. Mm-hmm. This is a, a sexy subject, right? Um, so basically these are, uh, they're substances that inhibit the effect of, of, enzymes. Yeah, of enzymes that help break down protein. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so what is an example of a protease inhibitor? Uh, <laughs> soybeans. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Did Which, you just like come up with that off the top of your head? Yeah. <laughs> so it took <laughs> me a minute. All the things. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, soybeans are a type of protease inhibitor mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, I don't know specifics on this because right. I don't consider myself it a must, protease inhibitor expert, but it must not be a really good inhibitor because I mean, a lot of people use soy beans for protein yeah. to absorb proteins. Right. Well, so, well, you know, I have my feelings about soybeans. Yeah. Um, I don't love them unless no. they're organic and fermented. Right. But, um, it's probably like everything else, mm-hmm. the dose makes the poison. Totally. Right. So just because you eat soybeans doesn't mean that suddenly you lose all of your protein. Exactly. Um, but, but that being said that, uh, if you struggle with breaking down protein, it's not just that your own protein status is going to be compromised. Yeah. It's that you're probably going to get some digestive issues from that. Right. Right. Totally. Because what we see all the time is that People have low stomach acid. You're really so yeah. sick of you hearing this so from tired. us, but <laughs> we're going to keep saying here's, it. Here's the thing. Important. As long as we keep seeing it every single day oh, gosh, in the clinic, every day, we're going to keep talking about it mm-hmm. because it keeps coming up over and over again. And I keep asking people, have you done the baking soda test? And they keep saying, what's that? <laughs> Guys, <laughs> the baking soda test. If you listen to this show and you come and do a hair analysis or a blood chem with us, and I ask you, have you done the baking soda test? <laughs> <You're> <laughs> no, no excuses. <laughs> so what is the baking soda test? Should we tell them really fast? Uh, sure. I feel like we just told them last week. But, but maybe like someone's just tuning in for the first All right, first. that's like fair. People don't listen to these in, in like order. Well, get with it, guys. No. Come on. Just Wait, kidding. Keep no. listening. Keep okay. listening. Don't leave. <laughs> I always tell people that come in the clinic. I'm like, I promise I'm not going to quiz you <laughs> because they always get really bashful. And now you're saying this <laughs> and you're going to make it so much worse. No, you guys are not going to quiz you. I promise. No, no. But I am going to ask you if you've done the baking soda test. And if you haven't, I'm going to tell you how to do it. That's all it is. So this is how you do it. All right. So fourth teaspoon of baking soda about four ounces of water. You Mm -hmm. mix it together. Very first thing in the morning before you've had anything else to eat or drink. There you go. You swallow that mixture down and you start timing until you belch. Mm -hmm. I didn't say burp. I said belch. Yes. A lot of people get like the little bubbles. Mm -hmm. They'll say, I drank it and I started doing little burps Mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. No, you want a big belch. Mm -hmm. All right. Like impress yourself. Not Homer Simpson impression, like (laughs) impressiveness. Maybe like two degrees below that. Right. Okay. Right. So, so the important thing is that it's not just a little, uh, right. Mm -hmm. It's a a real burp. Um, and if it happens pretty quickly within a couple minutes, then that's a good sign that you have sufficient stomach acid. Yeah. If, do, do it three times. Did you say that? Do the, um, the burp test three times? No, and I, I don't always make people do it three times. It I depends do. on how the results go. I always do, though. I find, sometimes you get a false positive. Yeah, but I find that by day three, they're starting to get indigestion I from know. all the baking soda. Yeah, so it's true. <laughs> it is true. So I don't want to do that to people. But anyway, um, if you burp pretty quickly, usually it's a good sign that you've got uh, sufficient stomach acid. If it's been like five minutes, you still haven't burped, you can stop timing. There's nothing going on there, right? 
Uh, and then if it's in the middle, then that's, that's where I'll usually say, okay, I think I need more data. Let's try this again. But, um, but here's the thing. If, if you don't have sufficient stomach acid, then you're not going to break down proteins very well in that case either, which means that, uh, those proteins are going to eventually make their way into your intestines anyway, and they're going to cause inflammation. They're going to, you're going to have poor absorption. Yeah. Um, and potentially it's going to feed the wrong bacteria in your system and lead to something like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. Yeah. Yeah. Whole list of problems that comes up. Totally. So you want to make sure that you're breaking down your proteins really well. And some of these protease inhibitors are going to work against you that way. Right. So I don't know, maybe you want to avoid them, but, but also... Uh, fermented soybeans can be one of the best ways to help regulate your hormone levels. Yeah. Um, you probably have heard many times that soy can cause estrogen dominance. Not a ton of research actually supports that in the end. Um, but, uh, if it's fermented, then you kind of, you get rid of all the potential risks of that soy Mm -hmm. and you still get all the benefits of it. There you go. So, um, one other thing I want to add is what I see in the clinic when I do the hair analyses is people that have the most healing to go, like they have a lot of inflammation. They are often really low in, uh, amino acids and fatty acids. So fats and proteins. Mm -hmm. So make sure you are getting your digestion in check because it's really important to help aid your healing journey. Yeah. Okay. Oh, something else worth mentioning on the topic of protease inhibitors is that sometimes they can help you. In fact, there is a, I think it's a whole class of drugs that is protease inhibitors that it, they're basically antivirals Yeah. because viruses need protease in order to do their replication. Oh, they do? Mm-hmm. Oh. And so a protease inhibitor can actually block the viral activity and potentially save you from getting even sicker. I did not know that. So there That's you cool. go. So maybe you need some more soybeans. I don't know. There you go. Okay. What's next? Um, lipase inhibitors. I, Amylase inhibitors. Yeah. All I the, mean, if, all the ACE I feel inhibitors. like if people feel like they need to go more into depth with that, go ahead and research it. Yeah. Because it, I mean, that could be the thing that makes or breaks you. Like, let's say you have been on your healing journey for years. Mm-hmm. You've been eating perfectly and like your inflammation is still through the roof. Like right. this could be the missing link. It could be yeah. one of these things, oxalates, like right. lipase inhibitors. Oh, and I forgot to mention some other sources of the protease inhibitors, mm-hmm. legumes and grains. It's okay, right. kind of a universal thing. Can you see why so many people are down on grains? Right. It's because they, they do tend to be one of the largest sources of all these different anti-nutrients. Well, and what we were saying um, it would, in the episode with Cecilia about the phytic acid is that like with GMO corn and grains, they actually have more of these anti-nutrients bred into them. Mm. Why? Because the anti-nutrients help preserve them. Mm. And so they like the GMO crops need to be really hardy so that they're not eaten by bugs and animals. Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, make a superfood that isn't digested by animals, but can't be digested by humans. And then guess what? Humans digest it anyways, because they slather it with like sugar Mm -hmm. and, you know, MSG. And now you have a society with gut dysbiosis, basically. Yeah. So, so be careful. And again, you can soak, you can cook properly, saute, Mm -hmm. steam with your nuts and all that, like soak them, sprout them. Right. That helps a ton. It helps release enzymes. It helps with so many things, you guys. There is one other anti-nutrient I want to talk about what? because it's one that's fairly common in a lot of things that people consume and that's tannin. Oh yeah. That's in teas. Tannins in teas and wines, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, some people's two favorite beverages right, right there. Right. But uh, tannin, tannin's kind of a, a mixed bag because while it can definitely interfere with the absorption of a lot of nutrients, yeah. it also might have some positive effects as well. Like what? Um, antioxidants. Oh, so, so tea is known to be very antioxidant in its mm-hmm. activity and they think the tannins might be at part least partially it? responsible for that. Interesting. Yeah. So 
just like a lot of these other things, it's not really black and white. Right. Now, if you were to just go online and look up what's wrong with all these different foods, like what's wrong with tomatoes or what's wrong with uh, bananas, mm-hmm. you're going to find something, something that could convince you that you should never eat this thing again. Right. And this is what we see all the time where people are like, oh, I cannot, I just, I can't touch that because mm-hmm. it does A, B, and C yep. terrible things. Yep. And if you do enough of that, your list gets so long that there is literally nothing left. Right. And that to leads eat, us. Basically, your list, your list of restrictions gets mm-hmm. so long. Mm-hmm. That's And so at yeah. that point, you have two options. You can do option A, which is to basically go on the carnivore diet Mm -hmm. because that would be virtually the only diet that would help you avoid all possible anti-nutrients. And chances are that there's one in there too that I just don't know about, right? And now to be fair, there are a lot of people who claim that the carnivore diet has changed their lives for the better, Mm -hmm. that they were just tons of people completely unfunctional and unable to do anything until they went carnivore. And now their energy levels are better. Their digestion is great. Their brain is clear. They've never been happier. Yeah. Uh, However, we also don't know any 80 year old carnivores that have been doing this since they were 20. Exactly. Because it hasn't been a thing for that long. I always see the carnivore diet to be like a stepping stone Mm -hmm. of like, stepping away from inflammation, Mm -hmm. letting the inflammation die down, and Mm -hmm. then you can slowly start reincorporating vegetables again. Yeah. Because, you know how I said earlier in the the episode, like the higher your inflammation... Well, did I say this? Or did I say it on Instagram? I might have said it on Instagram. Like the longer you've been inflamed, Mm -hmm. the less foods you can consume. Right. The less... Uh, ability to digest it that you have. Sure. So therefore people that are so far down the inflammation road, Mm -hmm. they have to go on the carnivore diet because they can't tolerate anything else ever again. Or at least that's what they've told themselves. Right. right? But long before we had the carnivore diet, we had the elemental diet, Mm -hmm. which is kind of the same thing, except for, you know, a slightly different approach to it where you're, Mm -hmm. you're kind of consuming some very basic Foods, they're more like shakes, I guess, drinks. Yeah. And they're supplying enough to keep you alive, Mm -hmm. but uh, none of the extra stuff that could contribute to problems for you. Right. And the point with that is to rest your body enough that it can heal. Mm -hmm. Right. Because if every time you eat, you're re injuring your digestive tract. Can can I give an example? Please. So I always say this in my clinic. You must, you must listen to my consults. So I always say this in my (laughs) clinic, like, if you break a leg, you go to a doctor, they put you in a cast Mm -hmm. and then you're not walking on that thing for three months. Mm -hmm. You're in crutches, you're Mm -hmm. resting. You're not, you're not doing anything, no weight bearing stuff. When your stomach breaks, I can't tell you don't use your gut for three months while it heals because you will die of starvation. Mm -hmm. So like you said, every day you digest, you are re-injuring it over and over and over. Right. So the reason why we are so passionate about digestive health is because like if you it's one it's the root system to your body Mm -hmm. like when the root system is ill the tree is ill Mm -hmm. all right so if your root system is sickly you're going to be sickly you're going to have a sickly tree Mm -hmm. so we have to heal that but how do we heal that if we have to use something that's already damaged right and so let's let's talk about that because the carnivore diet is one option there but would you really do you believe, Janique, that the carnivore diet is anti-inflammatory? I don't know. I'll be honest. Like, I think it is, it is elemental. Mm-hmm. It gives the mm-hmm. gut a break. Like, because let's say someone's been on the standard American diet for so long sure. that they have completely lost the ability to digest complex carbs. Sure. Then maybe that is something that, that, that they have to resort to. Right. So, and, and I think it's a stepping stone. So it is an extreme elimination diet. Extreme. Mm -hmm. But is all that beef bringing down inflammation or is it increasing inflammation? I, and I think it's different for everyone. I think it's very individualized, but is inflammation compared to 
what other inflammation, like Mm -hmm. inflammation through the roof that they were already dealing with, Mm -hmm. you know, like, because the small amount of inflammation with all that beef, you know, I mean, high amounts of iron in the colon is not great for the colon. That's the controversy around red meat. Mm -hmm. Um, But the inflammation that they've already been dealing with Mm -hmm. over years, potentially decades is, is ginormous in comparison to Hmm. eating more beef. And so you, you got to pick the, the lesser of two evils. And I think the lesser of two evils feels like health. Right. Right. Well, yeah, it'll be really fascinating to watch these carnivores in like the next five Five to 10 years to see if they're able to maintain their, the gains that they've received Mm -hmm. from it. Um, I hope they do. I really do. Um, but I am not ready to put myself on something like no. that and, and take that risk. Now, other options though, if let's say you are one of those people where it seems like you do respond negatively to every anti-nutrient out there. Every time you eat oxalates, you get a kidney stone. Every time you eat cruciferous, your thyroid explodes. Right. Um, what do you do if you also don't want to go on a carnivore diet? What are the other options out there for people? Are you asking me? Unless you just want me to answer it. That's up to you. I mean, I would <laughs> say fats. Eat lots of fats. Yeah. What would you say? Uh, well, you know, I, I've been thinking about this. I think that maybe something like uh, autoimmune paleo. Oh, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Or or GAPS diet, mm-hmm. the gut and GAPS. psychology syndrome diet. There's a low histamine. Uh-huh. There's... There is the elemental diet. Like mm-hmm. if you are in such a bad way, this is usually like we're talking ulcerative colitis. Right where you are on the verge of losing your entire colon mm-hmm. or something, then then maybe the elemental diet is what it's going to take yep. to heal you up. Yep. But um, but all of these options, essentially they're, they're elimination diets, yeah. right? They eliminate the most common sources of inflammation and give the body a chance to heal. Yeah. But here's the deal. Too many people misunderstand the purpose of these diets and they treat them as long-term lifestyles. Yeah. And we do not agree with that. Yeah, it's a um, stepping stone. Our opinion is that it is a stepping stone, which means you use it until you no longer need it. Right. And then you start very carefully transitioning out of it mm-hmm. so that you can enjoy the full benefits of all of the amazing whole foods that exist in the world. Right. And and that's our ultimate goal for people. Well, and here's and here's why. Because Research shows that the more diverse your gut biome, the healthier you are, the the stronger your immune system, Mm -hmm. like the less aging happens, Mm -hmm. the clearer your, like you have healthier brain function. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get an, like a diverse array of gut biome in the gut? Well, you feed it a variety of foods Mm -hmm. and especially like vegetables, complex carbs, fruits, Mm -hmm. you know, like fats, you know, fats and nuts and seeds, uh, fats and meats, Mm -hmm. you know? And so just, you know, variety is always best. The gut, the gut biome thrives off of that when it's healthy, Mm -hmm. when it is sickly, then you can't handle that yet. Right. So you have to then go more basic, Mm -hmm. you know, get the inflammation down and then, you know, spread out right? and then get the inflammation down and then spread out more. So you might start on the autoimmune paleo diet for, we'll say a month. Mm -hmm. And during that month, you're really focusing on your digestion, right? You're doing the baking soda test, making sure your stomach acid is good, Mm -hmm. making sure that you are pumping out the the pancreatic enzymes you need to help break down these things further. Um, You're making sure your gallbladder is functioning well so that you can emulsify fats and absorb them. Yes. And then you're looking at your lower digestion and you're, you're looking at whether there's dysbiosis there yeah. and whether you need to do some weeding and feeding yeah. to help get things rebalanced again. Right. right? And, and during all this time, yes, you're on an elimination diet in order to give your body a, t- a chance to do all the healing it needs to do. Mm-hmm. But then once you've got that digestion piece figured out, once you've got the lower digestion all balanced and the gut flora is looking great, now it's the time to start looking at what can we add back in. Right. And right. So don't, don't get stuck halfway through the process exactly. and then become nutrient deprived down the line. Exactly. And there you go. That's it. And that's, uh, that's, that's, that's anti-nutrients. <laughs> we went from anti-nutrients to digestion, to microbiome, uh-huh. which it all ties in, you guys. It does. Like it all, it really ties in all beautifully. And, so. and, and you know, maybe we don't talk enough about this, but the whole 
purpose of nutrition is to get nutrients into your tissues. Yeah. Right. Your cells need specific nutrients to do specific functions. Mm -hmm. And if they get low on any of those nutrients, they're going to have a hard time performing certain functions, which is what leads to disease down the line. Yeah. So ultimately the answer to disease is not a medication Mm -hmm. because that medication doesn't fix the nutrient deprivation. Right. All it does is block some other pathway in the body and create a new deprivation somewhere else. Yeah. So you get rid of the symptom. Yay. But then you Mm -hmm. cause five other symptoms. Yep. Um, what we need to have happen is we go back to the source. We figure out where is the, the current block in the nutrient absorption system Mm -hmm. and how do we fix that? And then suddenly your body has enough nutrients coming in and it's able to kind of figure out how to do that function again. And over time you heal. That's the best thing about the body is that it has the blueprint. It knows exactly what it needs to do. As soon as you give it all the right pieces and the right environment, it will know how to do that. Well, the body's the most intelligent thing on the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it knows its job well. You right. just have to allow it to have the right nutrients it needs, the mm-hmm. right coenzymes to allow it to do its functions. Right. Um, and then it does them. And yep. it does it really well. And like, that's why we focus on whole foods. Mm-hmm. If you're eating a variety of whole foods, then you have the best possible chance of a balanced diet where your anti-nutrients are being neutralized by your good nutrients Mm -hmm. and everything balances out just the way it's supposed to. There you go. So next time you're listening to some other podcast and they're talking about the evils of XYZ food, remember this episode and remember the context that they're talking in, Mm -hmm. that all of those evil things they're saying about this food group there's a pretty decent chance that it only applies to a limited group of people. Right. And that you may not be in that group and you may not be the type that needs to eliminate that food. Exactly. Uh, Before we close off, can I read a comment by one of our members? Oh, yeah. Because I love sharing success stories. And I think we should do this every episode. Also, you guys that are listening, um, we are going to have more guests on the podcast soon. We got lazy because COVID hit. Yeah. And then we were like, oh, we have to coordinate with people. Like, (laughs) we don't want to do that. What's the schedule? (laughs) (laughs) What's the schedule? Um, So who is our next guest? She wrote Sacred Cow. And they're coming out with a... Um, well, with is, a, is she our next guest? I think so. What's her name? Um, I don't know. You can't just put me on the spot like I'm this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> this late at night? It's after there's, midnight here. There's a there's a documentary coming out. Mm-hmm. Anyways, it's going to be really great, you guys. I can't wait. But, Actually, so as sad as this sounds, like I've been, I've been chasing her since... Uh, like November. October, November of mm-hmm. last year. Yeah. And... Um, she is just incredible. She knows so much stuff about nutrition and she has seen how meat has been villainized as a way of, of trying to make the planet healthier and also the, like the ecosystem healthier. Mm -hmm. Diana Rogers is her name. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm so sorry it took this long for me to remember it. It's 12 6 a.m. you guys. (laughs) But anyway, so her argument, and we're going to talk about this with her, but her argument is that it's not the meat. The meat is not the bad guy. It's the sourcing. Right. Exactly. And that applies to both our health and our planet's health. Mm -hmm. So if we want to heal the world, we don't go vegan. We re-examine our entire food chain. Exactly from the ground up, from the soil up. And we do talk about this a lot. We are really big into soil Mm -hmm. and it applies here. And actually cows are an important piece of that whole thing. I should say livestock in general, but anyway. Anyways. Yeah, we'll have her on pretty soon. Yeah, that'll be coming up in a few weeks. Well, I don't know. It might not go live until July. Oh oh yeah, that's right. Because it's going to go live around the time that her book is released. So yay. Okay, guys, I wanted to read you a comment that one of our members left. And her name is Jasmine. Is it Doolin? Jasmine, you're going to have to tell me. We've spoken (laughs) a lot online, but not like 
yeah. like voices online. <laughs> so she said, today I saw my rheumatologist. I still have a lot of fires to put out, but I am putting them out. It was great because every time I see him, he is blown away that I have made faster progress than he has expected. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. You guys, like when, when your doctor is impressed, you know, you're doing something right. Um, today he noted that three medications I have to take are three that most people complain about, but I, but I have had no negative side effects from them at all. Woo. We both are absolutely sure that all of the progress for my health has come from my change in diet and my effort to manage my stress levels. It made me so thankful to be part of this community that keeps me going strong and putting it and putting in the hard work. Mm. It's hard at times, but it's certainly worth it. There you go. That's so, amazing. Isn't that so great? Now, once again, we cannot take credit no. for this. No, no, um, no. Jasmine has been a rock star. She, she has totally made has. so many lifestyle changes for herself and she has thrown herself at this 100%. She totally has. Um, but we are just thrilled to be a part of her journey mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, I guess we can take a little bit of credit. Like we, we helped her come up with the structure, right? We did. I mean, she's in the membership. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I mean, she's been doing this for months and right. honestly, you guys, like, of course I'd love you to join the membership, but her health journey started by just listening to the podcasts. There you go. You know? And so like, there is so much stuff that you can do outside of the membership. Mm -hmm. If you want more structure, if you want more education, mm -hmm. if you want more handholding, mm -hmm. then join the membership, Yeah, you know? And it's such, it's been such a great community to see grow over the cup the past like week yeah. because we've had so many new members and they're all like sharing and helping each other. They're sharing their victories. They're sharing their defeats. Like one person just went on and said, I'm sorry guys, I have to vent because my doctor totally gaslighted me. Mm -hmm. And one, I love that they're using this language and they're mm -hmm. recognizing it yeah. and they're saying, and I'm, advocating for myself, but it's hard. Yep. And then all the other members like jumped on and they're like, I am so sorry that happened to you. That happened to me too. Mm. We're here for you. And it's just beautiful. It's yeah. beautiful that there's so many people in this space that want to help each other. And that, you know, that th you get frustrated and you get, you get stuck. Mm. And sometimes it just takes a community to help you get unstuck. So there you go. Absolutely. Well, that's it. We hope you enjoyed this episode, you guys. Um, if you want, please leave a review. Share us. Really love share that. us with your friends and family. <laughs> and thank you to everyone that already does do that. Mm -hmm. We really love you. I, We really, really do. So thank you for being a part of our community and being the positive change um, that you want to see in this world. I, I see it in you guys. So thank you. Thank you a million times. We love you. We do. And we will talk to you again next week. We will. Bye. See ya. Bye.